All right. Welcome to Entrepreneurship Week at the University of Denver. I hope everybody, <laughs> I love that. <laughs> yeah, right? right? Where else do you want to be on a Thursday night? But right here. I hope everybody enjoyed the many uh, forms of art displayed throughout the main floor of the community commons. I'd like to thank my, my DU colleagues in art, film, emergent digital art, and theater for making that all possible. This is our first time, definitely not our last, and we'll keep building on this experience. My name is Joshua Ross. I'm the Director of Entrepreneurship at the University of Denver. And on behalf of Entrepreneurship at DU, welcome. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm excited about our event tonight. We have an amazing panel of creatives, innovators, and entrepreneurs joining us, and a wonderful moderator to guide us through the discussion. So let's get this started. Please welcome our moderator, David Moak, the Director of Programming for the Denver Theater District. Thank you for that, appreciate it. I wanna welcome you all to uh, the University of Denver here for our, the Business of Art, How Creatives Can Build Economic Value for Themselves panel. Uh, first of all, I wanna give a big thanks to everyone here at the University of Denver, Joshua and Jalisa, Jermaine back there. Thank you so much for making sure everything worked out and bringing us here. Um, I'd also, yes, love to give a, a big thank you, of course, to uh, if any of you saw the projection on the side of building outside. If not, go ahead and check that out on your way out. Those of you joining us digitally, my apologies, you won't be able to see it, but our friends at Display Devices brought out a 21,000 lumen projector. So we're doing some art on the side of the building as you leave. Um, I also want to give a big thank you to the Startup Week team, uh, particularly Castle Searcy, for those of you that know her. She's done a great job stewarding the designer track for years. And yeah. of course, everyone at Denver Startup Week, for really it's done to help bring us all together. So as Joshua mentioned, my name is David Moak. I am the Director of Programming for the Denver Theater District. I am also uh, the Director of Nightlife Denver, which is the clock tower projection mapping you might have seen downtown. All this month, Meow Wolf has curated and uh, created all the art for it. So if you're ever downtown after dark, go check it out. I also am a co-founder of a gallery called Understudy. Uh, Got to give real credit to my partners, Annie Geimer and Thaddeus Smile, because they actually do all the real work. But if you're looking for something to do tomorrow night, we have an opening reception for Leo Kubakini, who is uh, our artist for the month. And we'd love to see you starting at six o'clock. But that's enough about me. On to our wonderful panelists. So I'm going to just do a quick introduction, read a little bit about them, and then we'll dive right into these questions. So first, we have Annie Phillips over here, who I've known for quite a while. Annie is the founder of IRL Art, a grassroots art collective of six, and I see you over there as well, yeah. who have already provided opportunities for over 1,300 artists. IRL Art focuses on large-scale group exhibits in order to build community, create mind-bending experiences, and promote skill share. Annie is a digital artist of 13 years, experimenting with the potential of technology to leverage impact and sustainability of those exhibits. The IRL Collective is a passionate group uh, passionate about the web, the future of the creator economy, and is well underway to becoming a blockchain-powered art cooperative. So search IRL Art, and you can find them both in real life and in the metaverse, which is a great term, by the way. Kudos for <laughs> being able to squeeze that in. Next, we have Thomas Evans, who is also known as Detour. You might have seen his murals around. He is an all-around creative specializing in large-scale public art, interactive visuals, portraiture, immersive spaces, and creative directing. His focus is to create work where their art and innovation can meet. A board collaborator, Thomas pulls from every conceivable experience that shapes his landscapes and perspectives. Explaining his work is no easy task, as his ongoing experimentations in visual art really set him apart. So he likes to mix music and interactive technologies, um, and his, pro his practice is always expanded. With this ever-evolving approach to art, Thomas's focus is on expanding customary views of creativity and challenging fine art paradigms by mixing traditional mediums with new approaches. Next, we have Shauna Schultz, who is a co-founder and the executive producer of a group called Mass Effects Media. They're a motion design and visual effects house based here in Denver, Colorado. And Mass Effects Media serves brands and films in their graphics and animation needs in the commercial, feature, and series realms. Their team did the graphics and visual effects for such programs as The Social Dilemma, which many of you might have seen on Netflix, Q, In a Storm, which was on HBO, and then even the Friends Reunion Special, which is right now on HBO Max. Uh, with a background in documentary, Sean has a passion for combining animation and nonfiction 
in storytelling, and she's grown Mass Effects to serve that unique part of the industry. And real quick, two weeks ago, another program she worked on called The Love Loves won an Emmy Award. So congratulations for that. If you'd like to, if you'd like to see that program, it's available on the CBS website uh, through their POV point of view program. So kudos on that. And finally, we have Vince Kaplebeck, who is a very awesome person and is replacing Corvus Brinkerhoff, who was originally scheduled to be here, but could not. So we're very pleased to have uh, another Meow Wolf co-founder in his place. So Vince is the founder of Meow Wolf, a collective uh, transformed into an award-winning art and entertainment production company specializing in immersive open world walkthrough experiences. Vince acted as leader and CEO for Meow Wolf through its formidable years and created a business plan for the House of Eternal Return in Santa Fe. He also uh, helped lead the team forward through its opening in March 2016. And then in January 2017, he formed Meow Wolf Inc., which is a, a full-fledged arts production company and a creative studio that really is positioned to create the largest, most innovative, and audacious monumental art exhibits in the world. After raising Series A funding, he announced two new Meow Wolves, including here in Denver, and of course the Omega Mart in Las Vegas. If you haven't been, I highly recommend it, as they are now open and uh, the tickets are on sale. Vince has been a force of vision in the realm of has been a force of vision in the realm of experiential art, and in 2020 launched his own company, a creative consulting agency called Spatial Activations. So uh, he's using that as a platform to usher in a new era of experiential art, and modern developments, and everyday life. So thank you for putting up the introduction. Now we can jump into the questions. So I'm going to ask a mixture of individual questions and group questions tonight. And my apologies, we may try to do a QA and a at the end, but just given how quickly this is, we only have about 75 minutes, I may just kind of run through a lot of this stuff. So we'll see how that goes. So my first question I'd like to ask is actually to uh, Thomas Evans over here. Thomas, you actually wrote like the book on how to be an artist. So you can see on the visuals up here, uh, that book is available pretty much anywhere books are sold right now. Tattered Cover, uh, Lawrence and Larimer is a local clothing store that sells it if you like to support locally, or of course buy it online. So this book is awesome, and it's a great resource and guidebook for any creative looking to really expand their artistic field. You started out by doing Art Tip Tuesdays, led you writing this book. So I'm curious, what took you from doing these like short little art tips to writing a full-on guidebook, and how has that journey been? Well, the book would, took about a year to actually write, but like, like you said, I do these things called Arctic Tuesday on my Instagram. So every Tuesday for the past six and a half years, not missing any Tuesday, not even for Thanksgiving, Christmas, anything, I basically do a tip for artists in the creative community just to help them out. And that just sort of spawned out of artists asking me questions on my Instagram account. When it went, first started out. So basically, I was like, let me figure out how to sort of uh, do a tip that everyone is asking about. So that started. And it just grew. Like I said, every Tuesday for the past six and a half years, I've been doing it. And then it was like, okay, people who aren't on my Instagram, how do they get these tips? So just something where I'm like, let me figure out a way to sort of reach more people. Uh, but also, too, get outside of my comfort zone because I'm not a writer. I, I never wrote. I basically communicate through visuals, like I think we all do. And then I was like, okay, let me just actually sit down and see if I can write a book. And that was sort of like a journey that I took that sort of helped me out evolve as an artist, figuring out how to communicate sort of my ideas and just like how to think differently. So basically it was sort of like a, a challenge to myself on how do I sort of uh, get outside my comfort zone, learn how to write better, learn how to communicate better, but also reach more people when it comes to helping artists out. And the book is something that people talk about. When I travel to different places in the world, not even in, just in the US, like even when I went to Buenos Aires, they were sort of like uh, talking about art Tuesdays and sort of how it would help. And so like the idea of education is super important to me wherever I travel because that's some, something that is on the first, I guess, uh, when people meet me for the first time, that's what they talk about. Not so much the murals or the artwork, it's like how I help them out in terms of, you know, this tip about how to save the canvas um, really saved my sort of next show. Or this tip about how to stretch out my paint really helped me out. So that's sort of like where the idea of writing the book came from, but it was meant, like I said, not only sort of just uh, just writing the book, it was basically like a challenge to myself 
and just helping out artists wherever they can. Great. I'd recommend every single one of you go and check out this book. If you're an artist yourself, it's a great guidebook. It can help you with a lot of things. If you're not an artist, but you want to know, you know, what's going through their minds or what maybe they're working on, it's a great way to look into that. So I just really wanted to shout that one out. Next, I want to talk to Annie here. So I'm going to be jumping around the PowerPoint, by the way. So Annie, you created really this incredible resource doc. So everyone see that URL. Those of you watching online, you're more than welcome to go there right now. Those of you in the audience here in person, just maybe think about this uh, URL later. You created this incredible resource doc in art and blockchain. And I'm wondering what led you to create it? And are there any specific, and by the way, this is just part of it. It's a very long webpage. What are some things you think are for someone new to this world to maybe start clicking on? And someone who maybe is, you know, well-versed in it, what's something maybe that's a little bit more uh, hidden or a sleeper link? Sure. So uh, oh. do I need to turn this on? Yeah. Boom. Can you hear me? Okay. So in February of this year, we got granted to fund several of our projects through a decentralized autonomous organization based loosely out of Tokyo named Unique One. And what I really tried to focus on with getting granted this funding was trying to establish passive earning and the idea of like baseline sustainability, both for us as individuals, but also for us as an organization. And I thought about writing an article, but I realized really quickly it would be really long and I wanted it to be more concise. So I put the resource doc together and it's pretty linear. So if you start at the beginning, it starts with MetaMask, AppSerion, some really basic fundamental tools that you'll need to start, you know, transacting cryptocurrency or any creating your NFTs. And so basically if you go down, then it goes into NFT platforms and kind of differentiates, you know, whether you need to put in an application or if it's an open platform, things like this, or if it's community owned and community governed. And then it goes on to talk about DeFi, some of the resources for passive earning and universal basic income. And then, then towards the bottom, more about like decentralized autonomous organizations, which are ultimately the groups that you can put in proposals to get granted for research or for producing art exhibits or a number of other things. And so for newcomers, I would recommend, you know, just getting started up at the top, but for people that are already familiar with cryptocurrency, Web3 or blockchain, I would recommend looking into Gitcoin if you haven't heard of them yet. Um, they're doing some really powerful work in the conversation around retroactive funding, which is essentially rewarding all of the participants of any organization, platform, company um, in the terms of participation. So say you've been a part of an organization and they launch a token, they will give that token to all of the participants to, you know, basically say thank you for, you know, creating the value of what this is. And then you become a voting member. And they're also doing some really incredible work with um, a term called quadratic funding, which is rewarding contribution higher than the actual money amount. And so, I know those are some big words, but if you look up Gitcoin, there, there's just some incredible discussions happening around the future of funding public goods and kind of moving away from um, more capitalistic models and funding like goods that need to exist in the world. So yeah, so if you haven't uh, really explored this world and want to, this is by far the best resource stuff you could imagine. It's also very locally focused. So, you know, there's elements there that you can go and talk to someone in the IRL art collective to learn more. Uh, so wonderful work putting that together. I've sent it to a lot of people. Uh, so Sean, I'd like to talk to you next about something really interesting and hop on to your little motion reel here. So you're based out of Colorado working in film and television. And, you know, that's an industry where usually we kind of see a brain drain of people leaving our wonderful state and going to one of the coasts. How have you been able to stay in Colorado? Is there anything that you would want to impart to this community to say, you know, you can stay here and do? And for those of us that aren't necessarily in your industry, is there anything we can do to keep you and keep your industry uh, here in the state? Yeah, good question. I think for us, uh, we stayed because we're stubborn. And I think early on, we started the company 10 years ago. 
Um, and one of the things that allows us to stay is that we're almost fully in post-production. So what we do is animation, motion design, visual effects. And so we can work with anyone, anywhere. And most of the filmmakers that we work with are in LA on the coast or other clients and brands are in other states. And they love the idea of this Colorado company. And so we're kind of, we've got a little bit of fun, you know, oh, you, you live by the mountains, you can see any time. <laughs> and so we, especially with like the pandemic and some of the things that have shifted and changed over the last two years, it's made our job even easier to be remote because everyone had to work remote and that big shift has really helped us. But I think in general, the patience of just staying and getting better and better as we grow our company and working on more and more documentaries and then the Social Dilemma was a documentary we did not know it was going to get as big as it got, <laughs> but we just like any film that we had worked on, we put all our all into it. And so getting that uh, kind of flip, I think really helped our company stay as well. Um, when it comes to uh, like, how can other people help us stay? I think one of the biggest things is film incentives of like helping our state have film incentives so people come here and they spend their money here for the film industry. And uh, we've had a lot of work actually on that. Most recently, the incentives, I think pre-pandemic were a million for the whole year, for the whole state, for any project. So, you know, hateful eight comes in and they have it all. And it's like, no more projects to Colorado. But now I think it just raised to 7 million, which is really exciting. So we're slowly building up those incentives to bring more people here to build our industry. So you would say to any students in the room that are looking to graduate from this program, and stay in Colorado, or would you recommend maybe that they do go to a, another market for a while? For us, we stayed and started our own company. And I think a lot of people who want to stay have to do that. I think you have to make your own work and you have to make your own job. And you have to bring the work here. And that's what we did. We definitely started on a lot of brands. A lot of our work really early on was we were doing commercial work and, and brand work, uh, a lot of kind of online videos and web content. And at, we just always on the side, we're working on films, working on films, building that network and that connection. For us, we also love documentary and there's actually a really good documentary industry here in Colorado. There's a lot of really amazing documentary filmmakers here too. So that helped us out as well. Awesome. All right, Vince. So one cool thing about Meow Wolf, I remember when you guys first did this, is you started to incubate artists to turn them into actual entrepreneurs and full on businesses. I think we're going wrong, but Nico Salazar, Future Fantasy Delight, was the first one he did. Um, what led to you wanting to take that next step with an artist, do something bigger? And what lessons did you learn that maybe you can impart to this community about, you know, developing an artist as, you know, almost an outside group trying to support them? Yeah, I mean, for me, like, the mission for me, I will, from the get-go, was to create a platform that others could be able to, you know, others could rely on. And can utilize to learn new skills to be able to then, you know, then it, it kind of developed. It's like at first when we were a collective, it was about learning new skills, about uh, you know, meeting other people who you know can learn arts, direct artistic skills from. But then when we became a business, it was now a platform that was meant to promote you know individuals' work, um, to be able to teach business skills, to be able to teach like um, the the production phases that are necessary to, to be able to deliver you know high quality work. Um, so that's that's still definitely the mission and intent of 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 the album. Um, and I think earlier on when we, when we launched the House of Eternal Return in 2016, it was a lot it was pretty it was a lot easier for us at that time to be able to kind of take the success of the project in Santa Fe and then start to think about where we invest the money. And we chose to invest in you know like Nico Salazar, uh, Future Fantasy Delight, and start to develop out um, his work into you know, merchandise and media entertainment work. Um, and we've done that with a few other artists. So like uh, Janelle Langford is, uh, is an artist of uh, Cityopolis. We did something similar. Um, and so for me, like that, that was easy for us to do. But then our focus ended up having to be that we had to invest all of our money, time and energy into getting Las Vegas open and get Denver open. You know, we had to focus and be like, we need those projects open. Now that those are open, it's like we're back in a position to be able to ask ourselves, like, where, where do we invest? What is the mission of the Owl? Where, where do we stand in this landscape of art and business? And for me, like, the elevation of the individual artist, separate from the brand of the Owl, separate from the company of the Owl, 
is like critical because like at the end of the day that's what this is all about for us it's like it's about getting art out into the world you know and so i think we're back in a position now you know we only opened denver like three weeks ago so we're back in a position now to be able to kind of have those conversations and consider where we go from here so with nico in particular what did you see that you could offer that really you know helped him out the most oh, well you know at first, like Nico had a room in Santa Fe, uh, mural room um, that he did by hand. Yeah, there you go. It's amazing. And we were just blown away by it. Like, and then people loved it. And it was on Instagram launch. And it was one of like the you know the most Instagram rooms. So we went to him and said, like, hey, we start making products. You know, are you into that? And uh, it was a cool, it was an interesting conversation because. Not everybody immediately, not every artist immediately was like, yeah, totally, let's make, let's make merchandise, you know, um, but he was down, he was just like, yeah, let's do it. So, so then from there, it was like creating a business plan, understanding how much money we're going to invest in developing those products, what are the product lines going to be, um, how do we market it, um, is this a meow thing or is this a future fancy light thing, how do we distinguish those brands, so it was just, you know, I think he's learned I'm going to have to ask him, but I think he's learned probably a lot with regards to product development for sure. And then also just like, you know, he's also been his own marketing, basically his own marketing platform, you know, so he's been, he's continued to own his Instagram, he's owned his, um, his Facebook page. And so he, you know, he's, I think, learned a lot about how to integrate with another brand. It's been a, a big partnership for him. So I'd like to stay on that kind of platforms and ask the other three of you here. What platforms do you use to really push out what you do in your heart? Whether it's ways to share it, like a social media or something that's very specific to your like industry and you know scene. As far as building virtual worlds, we've been really enjoying uh, crypto voxel, Somnium space, and we're really focusing on uh, building a lot of our own tooling. But what's cool about the virtual worlds is they all click through and you can, you know, really view each piece of art. It's, you know, respected link. So they become these like virtual shops and it's a real focus on uh, creative ownership. So you actually own the parcel, you own all the assets. And with the beauty of NFTs, you know, with royalties, every time anything that sells, you get, you know, automatic royalties every time things are sold. And, you know, we have a big focus of building our own tech right now with open source code. A part of Gitcoin, what I uh, mentioned earlier, is they have this other arm called GitHub, which is a giant repository of open source code and all for free. And you can, you know, participate in building the open web and get heavily rewarded for it. And, um, yeah, I also have been really enjoying uh, Telegram and Discord for ways of communicating about our project. Yes, I think that every artist is going to have like a different platform, but also too, I think every work that you do has a different platform as well, and a different audience. So like me, when I was like getting into NFTs and crypto stuff and like trying to do my own, it was Twitter and Discord and looking at the virtual galleries, whereas like my murals and stuff is like Instagram and TikTok and YouTube going to time lapse. whereas like, you know, other works may be on a totally different platform that not a lot of people know about because it's a very specific niche sort of market that I'm sort of working to sort of attract. So I think every platform or every piece of work that you do or every sort of lane that you have is going to have these different sort of areas where you know you can sort of niche down and sort of figure out that market and figure out where are they going to uh, or where do they hang out at and then try to find out that spot that you need to be at so like i have artwork that i put on instagram that i don't put on twitter or twitter versus you know pinterest or something like that so everything is going to have all these different little sort of uh, markets so i think every artist has to sort of do like an inventory of like you know what their work sort of and how they how it impacts a certain community or impacts a certain market and figure out where that market is but it's all over the place like you, you should never limit yourself in terms of uh, the places where you put up work you know you have your go-to sort of platforms that you really want to sort of put a lot of effort into but really i just don't limit yourself in terms of 
where you want to put the word. I'm trying to do we know like Chinese social networks in places as well. So I think I think I'm getting China. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no way to find out yeah, yeah, yeah. over there. So many benefactors want to help out. But you, Shauna, what do you use? Yeah, we I think after our work on the social dilemma, we don't use any social media. I think probably <laughs> LinkedIn is maybe the most active where I am. And then IMDB, of course, is really important for the film industry, which is like, but that comes from you get the credits and it gets posted. Um, but a lot of our work, our actual work is up on Vimeo, is probably the main place where we show our brand videos and any of our uh, portfolio. And then, of course, the streamers that our work gets to show up on HBO and Netflix and Disney Plus and stuff. So, yeah, we're really bad at social. <laughs> What about you, Vince? What's me out with uh, spatial activations using? Yeah, so like I'm going to sound like such the, the corporate app here, but like I agree, LinkedIn has actually been surprisingly powerful. And I think the thing about LinkedIn too is like people are just like, oh, that's not a business, like, you know, kind of BS. But then once you actually post interesting content on there because it is so dry, because it is so boring, and you post like really good like art, people flock to it and then you end up getting work out of LinkedIn. I got so much work this past year out of LinkedIn, like just directly, you know, and I think it's, you know, on Instagram, on TikTok, like your, your creative can get lost because it is just so innovative. Obviously it's a great platform, but and on LinkedIn, you know, like good, good creative, good art stands out. Um, and there's people there who are looking for it. You know, there is, it is a marketplace for sure. Um, and I'd say like, in, you know, uh, internally for, you know, for internal work, I don't really know what the company uses. I probably, you know, but I know that one piece that we, that we use that's really helpful there too. Like, it's an incredible um, piece of software for this, for, for visual art. Like, just the way that it's able to, to manage, you know, manage, J, you know, uh, JPEGs and, and like video files and stuff um, in association with, you know, catalog and the streamer. Great. Well, if any of those are familiar with, go check them out. And apparently, update your LinkedIn profiles. Yeah, recently. So, um, speaking of like posting things online, you know, something that I always found interesting. So, one of my old jobs, I used to day to day manage the band of Boshka, and it was really funny because for the uh, couple of their eras, they wanted black and white photos, but a lot of press want color photos. So, people would go and go online and just find an old press photo and use that for whatever they wanted to use. So, permanency in the digital realm is a really interesting thing because sometimes when you post something, you pull it down. Other times, it's going to be up there forever. So I'm just curious, you know, we can go down the line against you with you, Annie. How do you feel about the fact that, you know, you have some of your early artworks and early things on that people can find, and even though these days you really want to go in one direction, it's still, you know, Google is your friend and your enemy. Um, do you have any advice, too, to the young people in the audience right now who are posting a lot online that, you know, might not be thinking of permanency? And then anything for those of us who also deal with this, you know, good ways to kind of balance everything. Yeah, and so I'll say two things. So um, a mentor once said, um, if you know your full vision, basically just reverse engineer your way to that. And if and it's a litmus test of like, if what you're doing is still on the path. And so, you know, if, as long as you know, like where you're trying to go, I think that hopefully you can look back in your work, you know, really still speaks to um, your current self, or at least as like, getting you to where you're going. Um, but with um, NFTs, I will say I minted about 35 of my own works and looking back because of the permanence with them, I wish I had have done um, them chronological or I had of groups them by style. I kind of didn't realize how um, explosive the whole Web3 world was going to get. And so I was just really being experimental and posting old work and new work. And um, I wish I had been a little bit more thoughtful about my plan because looking back, I could have made a bit more cohesive of a, of a portfolio. But you can always burn NFTs if you still own them. And then, um, but yeah, once it's sold, it's out there. So unless you like can buy it back or something. But um, yeah, I would just... You know, try to figure out what that bigger vision is and know that you're still on the path and hopefully you can avoid cringy moments. <laughs> I say as, as an artist, it's very interesting because I don't know if anyone else has, I'm still on Facebook. It popped up, they have these posts that pop up like, yo, this is what you posted 10 years ago. And I'm like, <laughs> yo, what the fuck? <laughs> And you see exactly where you came from, which is good. 
uh, too, because if you go back into my Instagram feed or my hands feed or whatever you're looking at, you can sort of see where I came from and my first mural. And then what I was doing five years before my first mural. And what I was doing when I was going, you know, to University of Colorado Denver at that time school and see what I was posting up in terms of the art stuff I was doing. So when people sort of talk to me or come to me now and sometimes collect my work, they always talk about, I remember when you did this piece. And I'm like, yo, that was 10 years ago, 12 years ago. But it sort of it tells the story of my art career a little bit. So a lot of times when artists think that a lot of times people will collect the art in that sort of physical piece and it's the, the aesthetics of it. But a lot of, 99% of the time, they're collecting the story behind the artist and what the artist sort of went through and sort of everything that the artist embeds into that work. And when they have sort of these reference points to go back on, I think that's a great thing for the artists themselves in terms of building up their career, building up their name, building up just their identity because people see this is where you came from. This is the steps that you took to get to where you're at. This is how you evolved over time. This is basically your life story. So this is why I'm buying your piece right now is because I saw all these different steps. And so where you came from, even like now, it's like going from Santa Fe to now, it's kind of like, oh, they went from a small space to a large space and they have totally different artists. It's like just seeing everyone just evolve. And I think having those little footprints or bed breadcrumbs to sort of go to and look at is really good because that's basically what we're trying to do is that we're trying to tell a story with the work that we do. And the more that we have to sort of for people to look at and figure out these different clues and where we sort of are and where we, like I said, we came from, it's really good just to have them sort of get that full breadth of knowledge of like your identity and sort of like your essence and sort of what you're about type of thing. So for me, it's, it's always been good, even though it does make me feel old when I see the old polls. You know, it's like, oh, this is, this is where I was, this is where I am now, and I'm glad I would do all of that. And I'm glad that other people see that as well. So, but you, Shauna, how do your student films stack yeah. up against the social <laughs> dilemma and any award-winning documentaries? Yeah, I think we were chatting about that a little bit, so I went back and looked it up. I was charming. Like, I was like, oh, for a student film, I wasn't terrible. I did a lot of musicals. I was very into musicals. <laughs> I think, though, I love that, what you said, and to build off that sentiment, uh, when we are hiring, the, my favorite thing and some of the best artists that we've ever hired, what attracted us the most to them were their personal projects and also seeing where they came from and how they've grown. Because I think even young artists, like they're two, three years out of school, if they've still got their student work and we're seeing what they were doing when they were in college and then where they are now, it's exciting to see like, okay, they did that in two years, where will they be with us in two years and where are they gonna grow? And we see the motivation of them working on their personal projects and doing tests and things like that. Like that also builds, I think, the story of you as an artist. And then also you're more attractive as an employee if you're trying to get hired somewhere or even a client for people to see the work that you've done and where you've come. I think there's a huge value in that. Um, I do think if you have stuff that's cringy, it's it would be very difficult to get it off of there. <laughs> but like there's there's kind of like, you know, think about that as a student. What are you working on and <laughs> what are you putting out in the world? Just remembering it might be there forever. So. Yeah, I think that it's a beautiful sentiment the way that you said it. But you, Vince? Yeah, I mean, I, I think like just generally, uh, you know, thinking about what kind of actions do I take or what type of expressions do I have and where can you come, like what kind of place can you come from to align those actions and expressions in a way that's going to be healthy for you no matter what those actions or expressions are. Um, and so whether it's posted on social media or not. So I think like what's, you know, significant for me, just in my life, kind of outside of art business, is who, like, what is your future self? Like, what, what, what is your future self? What's the, what's, where are you going? What's the vision? Where is, you know, who's, who's the Vince, you know, 10 years from now, 15 years from now, uh, 15 years from now? Like, you are who you are becoming, you're not who you have been. And if you can switch your mindset into a place of, I'm not the person who's, you know, lived a life for 39 years and all these things happen, but instead I'm the actions and expressions I take today moving forward into this self that I'm being into the future. And that that switch, what that switch does is it allows for any action and any expression to be 
part of the journey kind of similar to what Andy was saying. It's that like you have you have all of those actions trying to roll up to some future vision. And so even if you screw up along the way, if, if that future vision of yourself is anchored to a social mission, it's anchored to, to something that you truly believe in, like a why that you truly believe in, then it doesn't matter if like there's a mugshot on you on, on Google, which there is, or it doesn't matter like you know what articles were written, or it doesn't matter like what crap you already created, because it was all part of the journey based and anchored in a why that was meant for a future self that you think about. You know, so I think that that's really important. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, it's a great response. So now I'm going to get a little specific on some stuff. But my goal is some of your students, some of your professionals, like I had hit it all. But Annie, I want to talk to you about something absolutely amazing you're doing these days. And that's some of the granting opportunities within the crypto and uh, NFT world. So really what I'm most curious on is how is it different than more traditional arts grants that people might be familiar with? And, uh, you know, how could the greater artistic community benefit from kind of what stuff like this IRL Art X Sushi Swap program is? Oh, yeah. So I, so we, we've had great success um, with putting in proposals to different DAOs to get funding and, you know, even groups reaching out to us just to want to support our efforts. And um, basically, I mean, there's, there's hundreds, if not thousands of these decentralized autonomous organizations, which are community ran bank accounts, basically, and um, community voted, community governed, um, community stewarded. And um, there's, a, you know, giant billions of dollars of capital. And it's so, um, it's so different. It's so empowering. Um, you know, it's self-created. So you can uh, come up with a vision. You know, I think there's a nuance to like finding the right community. So you certainly wouldn't want to go to an art DAO and put in a grant for ocean conservation. Maybe if it was an art ocean thing, I don't know. But I think um, finding the right community and um, you know, so on the bottom of the resource doc, I listed five or six different kind of uh, marketplaces for DAOs. So you can search and find different groups and, and what they're focused on, what their goals they're trying to achieve. But yeah, you can put in proposals in our Discord channel. I've been putting um, all of our templates for every proposal that we've successfully um, gotten out uh, there and funded so that other people can just basically fork it is what we always say, but copy it and uh, use it for your own benefit. And so um, the idea, and, and there are, there's local um, other organizations that have co copied our templates, gotten funding from similar groups. And I think for me, it's just empowering because it's self-driven, you know, I'm not having to apply or compete um, against other funding. So it's also bringing funding literally out of the ether and into real communities. And so, um, you know, instead of applying for grants that are on a city, state, or federal level, um, you know, this, this funding is coming from the internet and global communities and really has an ability to have high impact in real worlds. And um, yeah, on, on the resource doc, there's a lot of, um, DAO information and um, that would be a good place to start. So you're saying that most of this money comes from just people putting it into a pot that gets divided out or who's actually funding a lot of this? Oh, it's, it's different things. So I, I guess I could use uh, Super Rare as an example. So I've been listing my art on Super Rare since 2019 and I've sold about 35 pieces and I've you know, they're, they're all sold. You can look and see how much they're worth. And the, uh, recently they launched their own token and retroactively gave all of the artists and all of the collectors who have ever bought or sold work on the platform about 10 times the amount of the value of work they had bought or sold. And now those people get to be um, voting members of the community as well as um, benefit from the value that was created in making Super Rare an incredible platform. And so now as a voting member, I can go in and use my tokens as a vote. 
and vote on other community members' proposals for things like starting a gallery space in Latin America to support Latin American artists, which I'm really excited to vote on. Um, but yeah, so that's one example, but there's so many because the web free space is so expansive. I mean, a lot of tech, a lot of environmental, a lot of art, and really we're, you know, building the new internet. So there's a lot of opportunity. <laughs> yeah, I am definitely very, very uh, limited in my knowledge of this, but every time I talk to Annie, it just seems like there's a big opportunity out there. So I really encourage a lot of you to explore this world if you haven't, because there is probably a way you can, you know, get involved in, you know, through groups like IRL, they're really trying to provide you with the resources and templates you need then go and get that funding, um, which is still competitive, but a lot less competitive than going after, say, a, a public art piece in Denver. Um, Shauna, you and I have talked a lot about, you know, when Mass Effects Media reached a point, you really needed to go and get kind of outside help and stuff. And I'm curious, you know, for other people in this group who might have businesses that are reaching a point where they feel like, okay, I've done everything I can as my entrepreneur, how do I go and, you know, get more resources or just find out where to go from here? Um, any advice you'd give them? And, you know, in general, at what point did you really realize, okay, I should probably go and then start finding some things that I hadn't been looking at originally? Yeah, we, so when we started Mass Effects, we started it only to do this four month project. So me and my husband, Matt, quit our full time jobs to go travel the world and do a dog project. We rode on a ship and we went around to 13 countries in four months. And it was the most epic project. And then we got back, and we're like, okay, now we own a business. And so we both went to film school and we were artists. And so we didn't know how to run a company. And I think our, our rate at the beginning was $25 an hour for both of us. And I was like, this is gonna be great. We'll make $2,000 a month. And we're just gonna make $24,000 a year. And it's gonna be perfect. Cause it's like all our expenses are gonna work out. And then our bank account just kept going down. And I think it was about three years in when I was sitting at my computer looking at my Excel spreadsheet of how I was keeping track of our accounting and I was like we're we're gonna run out of money <laughs> and so like how, but we're working day and night we're working weekends like how are we out of money and so I called the local uh, small business development center uh, which the SBA runs small business SBDCs all over the place and uh, they were like okay why don't you come in and like just bring a PL statement and I was like what's a PL statement and she was like honey get in here <laughs> so I went in I took a business class and for the next like two years I just took every single business class that they had I, I got the mentor you can get free mentors and just sit one-on-one -on -one for six sessions and as soon as I finished that I get another mentor and I just used all those free resources or they were really cheap some of them are 40 bucks for a how to start a business company, <laughs> uh, uh, sorry, how to start a business class. And it was amazing. Like I basically got my degree in business uh, just through the SBDC. Um, and, and then after that, like as I grew uh, a few years ago when it was time to hire employees, uh, that was a whole different ball game. And so when I went back to the SBDC and took a thing about HR and like, turns out you have to pay them and like have taxes and stuff. And how do you do that? So. All of that, I just, I took all the like free courses that the SBA puts on and it was hugely valuable. Uh, and then as we grew about six years in, uh, then I, I got a mentor who runs specifically creative firms. And so I took a couple of courses on that because we're a different breed, <laughs> we, we creatives. And so that then just like our, our company was able to really build and make some really positive decisions to do more film because that's what we love to do. And it was like, how do we do that? So that mentor helped us through that. So, so much help from outside places. And uh, yeah, so now I run like all the business side of things. We've got 12 people full time and typically around 20 people with our contractors. And it's a big machine to run. <laughs> like, you know, we're small, but uh, I think that a lot of that was just like realizing we do want to continue forward. What help do we need? And where can we get it? We got some great resources. Awesome. So yeah. So of course the you know University of Denver here has great programs as well and entrepreneurship whole programs you can go through. But if you're looking for something you know very specific or don't have a lot of funding, you need to have it soon. Uh, the SBA is a wonderful resource. So just wanted to throw that one out. So then something interesting with Meow Wolf I've always thought about was how your strategy to keep it sustainable has probably changed over time. You know, and, and really, we're here talking a lot about what makes a company and if it's sustainable. 
And I'm imagining that COVID also threw quite the wrench in a lot of that stuff too, because you had to, to rethink. So how has your definition of sustainability changed over the last few years, both from Yelp and your own company? And you know, what advice would you give to people in this audience and watching online to stay and make their business more sustainable? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, that's my goal. Yeah, because it has changed. I was actually just thinking about this today. Um, and like, it's a, for us, it's, it's been a, a bit of a pendulum at first. Like when we were, when, when we were collective um, and we were just kind of a group of friends, the most valuable resource for sustainability for us was like positive mental attitude and collaborative energy. Like that, you know, like if you if we couldn't collaborate, we couldn't come to, you know, come to these projects with like positive mental attitude, then then nothing was gonna happen. It's gonna be total drama, you know. So so that was like the most important thing at that point. Then we ended up kind of forming a really great social group and group of artists that were collaborative, but we were all now like in our 30s and the projects we're trying to do were way larger than we had ever really imagined them to be. And we still weren't making any money because we were doing it through kind of traditional art industry means, you know, nonprofit grants, you know, stuff like that, um, art gallery, art world. Um, and so there wasn't much money there. And we were a big group, we were like 50 to 100 people at that point. So we couldn't afford to even do these projects at that point. So then at that point, sustainability became about money. It's like, okay, we need to be able to sustain financially ourselves and you know, as an entity in order for this art to continue to be created and to get bigger and to be more, more incredible. Now we're at a point where having raised the capital necessary for Vegas Center to have, to have Santa Fe running, you know, it's like to me, sustainability now is about empowering the artist, like, which isn't which is different than like. Which is different than like making sure that the company has enough money or making sure that everyone's getting paid. It's like how do we value and empower and trust in the arts? You know, um, because like the last couple of years has been we've been very much focused on like you know project delivery, project management, um, corporate, you know, kind of corporate support, HR and finance and accounting, and like we needed that, so, you know, desperately needed. We go to the Apple Denver, you'll see like, damn, this took a lot of like logistical thinking, you know, and we needed that to open this project. So we got to get back to a place where it's like, all right, now to be sustainable, because like none of, none of the art exists if you only focus on that stuff. Like, you know, artists are going to be like, screw this, we're doing this. Yeah, so it's like getting to a point where we can say, all right, in order to sustain this, we need to be able to focus on and value and trust and empower the creative, you know? And I think it just is going to continue, continue to move. You know, like it's going to continue to evolve in that way. But I think what's interesting about art is that it's like, yes, you need money to create art, but if it's about the money, it's going to be about art. <laughs> like oh. Fundamentally. So it's like that balance is like what really critical. I would agree. And actually, you know, something really interesting kind of to go off at is the financial literacy. And a lot of artists, I feel, might not have quite the level of financial literacy that you might need to run a business. And, you know, you went, Sean, to go talk to the SBA and all these other things. But I'm just curious, you know, for any of you in the panel that wish to talk about it, like, were there any resources or programs or things you think would be beneficial people to go to if they feel like they're missing some elements in the financial literacy world, as in just, you know, everything from basic, how do I do a budget or you know, send an invoice to something a lot more complicated? I guess it's a hard question. I mean, because it changes so much sometimes um, in terms of like how to get payments. You know, because I started out, didn't have, there was no Venmo, but now everyone's on Venmo. Um, contracts, you know, sometimes it's the same, but then it's kind of like they change up all the time in terms of what people put in there. And then there's just new ways of creating art where it's kind of like the financial issues like crypto. Like how the hell do you do crypto? How do, how do you get a contract? You know, all these different sort of situations, but there are resources where it's kind of like, yeah, you can definitely get the basic knowledge of like, the money you put into a business, that's what you use. And if you take out more than you put in, you know, you're going to run out of money, you know, like you were saying. So I think the basic knowledge can be sort of gathered from, you know, classes and workshops on campus or even YouTube. I did a lot of stuff through YouTube as well, learning that. And I went to business school. I went to business school, but they only teach you the basics, right? But they don't teach you about the real world. Like, oh, this is how much I owe taxes. 
oh, the tax policy changed this year because of this policy. Now I owe this, but then, okay, if I do an LLC, but I'm taxed with an S corp, this is what I have to do. This is how much I can keep. Type of thing. So it's, it, there's all these different ways of going about it, but you can learn. Um, you can learn as much as you can um, through, you know, kinds of YouTube books, uh, workshops, SBA. Uh, but sometimes it's different in the real world. But also, too, it's like I had to learn, you know, I'm not good at everything. So I actually hired to an accountant now. So I have an accountant that has been doing my taxes for the past five years. He's the one that set me up with all these different things that help me not pay off the same as much as I was. And then also, too, I have uh, a lawyer. So I have a lawyer, I have a patent lawyer that I pay in patents. Uh, but it's like, I don't know everything, so I have to actually learn, you know, how to delegate, you know, how to scale up type of thing, which is what a lot of artists sometimes don't know or don't sort of think about. Uh, but it can be sort of something that we learn when we first start out. So I wish a lot of art schools would have it, because that's one thing that I hear a lot of artists talk about. So they never had the know-how to sort of uh, figure out just basic budgets or how to do grants, or even if they get a grant, how how's that tax? How much do I need to sort of keep to the side type of thing? But all that, a lot of that stuff sometimes is just like going through experiences and learning, okay, this is how it's done over here. And this is what you do. If I make, you know, 20,000 in the UK, okay, how's that going to what am I taxes? How do I, how do I budget for that? So I mean, I didn't think about about that a lot, um, and I get I think I hit some penalties too. Um, but that's one of those things. Kind of like that's when you learn that you need outside help as well. Hopefully, it's too long. But you've been saying, yeah, you know. So I like the first business. The, the first business um, that I got into was throwing parties back in like the like the mid two thousands. And it was like, it, it, and I guess my point is, is like, start small and start where your passion is, but start small and don't be afraid of it. But it was like, how much am I gonna pay the DJ? How much am I gonna charge at the door? Um, you know, how much am I gonna spend on decorations? And then at the end of it, make sure everybody gets paid and then how much I have left. And just the, just the basic like production budget, potential revenue, what are the expenses? What's my profit? And you can start really small. It can be like a thousand dollar party that we put together. and I, made 1200 or we only made 700 start small and then all that really happens is that like you add more numbers to it but it's the same process it's how much is it going to cost me to make it um how much do i think i can make from it how much is it going to cost to operate it and then what's my profit after you know what i mean and and then just kind of learn that process enough fail enough fail over and over and over again and you know when it comes to financial aspects and just keep keep at it you know, and so I'd say like a lot of times, just the thought of finances or the thought of money or the thought of budgeting, I think is kind of scary that a lot of folks don't want to even just take that first step, but start small. And then like once you learn the basics and it's that small, it's kind of the same basics even, even when it gets like a bigger degree. Yeah, so a big part of our projects over uh, the last seven months uh, really condensed that we've really built in um, budgets for all of us to do more education around financial literacy and do more one-on-one -on -one support with all of the artists as we're onboarding them into the NFT space, teaching artists things like, you know, setting up a wallet, exchanging, bridging tokens, um, how to mint an NFT, how to get the money into your bank, and going through that whole process. And so that was part of what the resource doc, what, how that transpired was a lot of the same things. Um, but also another great tool that's on there is Bright ID. It's an app you can get on your phone. And there's about 20 apps on the app that will basically guide you through and you can like um, earn to learn or learn to earn. And so there's opportunities to earn tokens uh, by completing different tasks. One of my favorite ones is called Rabbit Hole, um, where you go on Quest. But basically, it's a way to learn all of these different, um, like how to add a network to your wallet, how to bridge tokens to that network, all of these different things. 
at no cost to you, which I think is really a great way to start going. And then there's a lot more information on there too about um, universal basic income and passive earning. Yeah. yeah, I think that, I mean, I can't sing the praises of the SBDC enough, but I, I think also one of my mentors told me this, and it's so true, just if you pursue your passion, the money will follow, but you have to have the patience. So I think what you were describing of like the phases of the business where the team, you're like, we're doing it, and it's all positivity, and you're not making any money, you're eating ramen noodles, and then you get to a point where you build a machine that you have to make the money to run the machine, and so your focus shifts to run the machine and you kind of forget about the art and then you get to a point where maybe you get known enough or you get big enough and now people like your art and now you don't have to market as much and it's word of mouth and you can kind of refocus on your art and it's so much work and so much time to get to that point that you have to love it like if you're not passionate and you're not loving it you're not doing the right thing it's not worth the amount of work that goes into it especially as an entrepreneur so I think that other thing of just like the gut check all the time of like, am I still loving this? <laughs> or maybe the delegation part of it of what do I love about it and what do I need to delegate so I can focus on my genius and what makes us good with what we do with our company. So I think that might be another little piece that isn't a tool, but you know, just a piece of advice. And just to follow that up with regards to you know love and passion for what you do, like. Yeah, absolutely. That's the most critical. When, I, when we were first when we were first trying to get the house in Toronto, Ontario in Santa Fe, um, when I went and visited this old bowling alley and I walked around with a real estate agent, and the real estate agent says, "Okay, cool. So you want to buy this bowling alley? How much money do you guys have? How much money did you know about? Uh, how much money do you guys have individually? None. Literally broke. Got no money. Who do you know who has money? And I said, "Well, George R. Martin has money. I know him. And that's when the line of building." But the other person that I thought of was the current mayor of Santa Fe, his name's Alan Weber. And I went and talked to Alan. He's the founder of um, a fast company magazine. And I went back to Alan. I said, Alan, you want to buy this bowling alley? He said, no, not really, but I'll give you advice. So what you need to do is you need to be able to understand what you're going to do with the bowling alley. And you need to go and talk to every single person, no matter who they are, no matter what level of you know class they live in, no matter how much money they may have, no matter whether they're family members or total strangers, you can talk to everybody about this project with total love, total passion, and total belief in, 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 in the ability to get it done. And so that was the 18 month fundraising uh, process for me, was just like getting real core with myself on the passion of the project and then speaking from that place. You know, and what's cool that I realized recently is that the you know, etymology of belief is love that that's where it comes from is love so it's like you need to operate from love in order to be able to create to actually believe that you can create you want to create you know so do you all like what you do just out of curiosity 100 all right it took me a while to get there sometimes but i quite like it as well um so since a big portion of you know today and the stuff of course before the panel had a lot to do with technology i want to kind of close a little bit by talking about some of where tech fits into all this stuff and what you are all excited about. So Thomas, I want to start with you. So I have this cool video, which is something you did. So do you first want to explain people are sitting, it's really unique. And then two, you're really at the forefront of kind of incorporating you know, technology in your art. So uh, what excites you and, and where do you think this stuff is going? What limitations do you find? Yeah, so this is something that I kind of built uh, within the past month. And basically, it's just like a XY gantry that goes around, and basically, it's tied to a uh, microcontroller that you can sort of sample sounds. So basically, I'm playing, I can't hear it right now, but it's like I'm playing a beat, and then each trigger is sort of triggering the spray paint. And this actually is in my studio, it kind of seems like very studio. But, um, this actually came from me, I think we were talking about this earlier too getting, I don't say bored, but just like, I was in a place of creating on autopilot. And as artists, sometimes you go through this when you sort of creating, 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 and you're just like going through deadlines and projects and projects and projects. I was doing that traveling, creating murals in different places. And then people love the work, so they want the specific type of mural. And then you're sort of doing the specific type of mural. And then it's kind of like, you don't feel like you're sort of creating um, while you're being excited about what you're doing. And I, been doing, I've been going through that feeling for the past year, and then finally, 
I was like, let me just get outside of my box and figure out how to do something different. And so, uh, just evolve as an artist. And for me, I've always been, you know, interested in technology. So it was kind of like, okay, let me actually go revisit that um, sort of part of my practice where it's kind of like incorporating, you know, circuitry and, you know, sort of uh, music and, you know, machines and all these different things, but also learn as well. So I learned how to use uh, this program called Fusion 360, which is kind of like the musical product and stuff. And basically learn from YouTube, still learn from YouTube. And then I bought a 3D printer. So a lot of the parts that you see, so like I couldn't buy that off the shelf. There's no sort of book to sort of tell you how to do it. So I actually had to learn how to actually produce a lot of the pieces that I was using to actually create this gantry and create all the stuff that I was doing. And from there, it sort of like got back the excitement when it came to uh, just getting up in the morning. Because when I first started out in art, I'd get up at four o'clock in the morning just to race to the studio to paint. And then it became, you know, five and then six and seven. And then now it's like I'm going back at four o'clock in the morning, racing to the studio to see if that, you know, print is done on the 3D printer. So I can use it for the next thing. So like incorporating technology into my stuff is like my passion. Uh, it's always been my passion now, it's like actually revisiting uh, that part of my practice. So now it's basically trying to figure out exactly where I can be at the intersection of, you know, art, technology, music, but also collaboration as well because I'm not a musician, so I'm actually bringing other artists into my space to actually utilize some of the stuff that I'm creating to actually enhance it a little bit more than what I could have done. So a lot of times it's really just me in the studio thinking of an idea and saying, okay, what would this look like? What would this be if I sort of created it myself? And I have now all the parts to actually create my sort of idea that I have and figure out whether you know it's something that I like or not. But it's like it takes me, you know, days and days to figure out and troubleshoot problems. But that's what I love about you know this venture to uh, this area because technology is always changing. I know it's like if a new camera comes out or a new plugin comes out, it's like you got to figure out how to change with it. So like five years ago, people weren't talking about NFTs and crypto. Now artists are actually making a living off of it. So we have to sort of figure out, okay, how do we sort of get outside of our comfort zone and figure out how to uh, keep climbing and evolving as artists and sort of figure out how can I utilize this new technology? You know, 30 years ago, digital art was something that not a lot of people did. But now it's like every artist puts on perfect in their iPad and they're making, you know, amazing work. So it's like, okay, technology is sort of what that next step was kind of like learning coding. In school, it's kind of it's basically, I, mean, I, I don't know if they, do they teach that in school, like yeah. grade school now. Yeah, coding. So, like, these kids are going to learn how to do this a lot earlier. And it's going to be more involved in sort of our daily lives and sort of like what we do uh, with some of these sort of items and things like that. So, it's kind of like me just making sure that I'm always evolving as an artist and like staying on top of like new technology and new sort of mediums to actually incorporate into my work. And, you know, that's like, Artists are sort of problem solvers. We do it critically. Now I'm not just stuck with using spray paint or brushes to solve this problem creatively. I'm able to use technology and music and instantry and different things to actually solve that problem. Mm -hmm. Shauna, what about you? Because I actually have a cool little video up here of uh, how you put together some social dilemma graphics. Yeah, I think um, I, I just call my team a bunch of magicians because we can make or do anything. Like if you can imagine it, we can create it. Um, the latest technology we've been playing with is actually um, AI, ironically. <laughs> um, but there's some new like AI that you can use. We use Nuke, which is a node-based compositor. So you can basically uh, put different images and videos together in, uh, in Nuke. Uh, there's a thing called rotoscoping, and so in visual effects, you might have to cut somebody out and put them on a different background, and someone has to go frame by frame and cut them out every time, and as technology advanced, now you have keyframes, so I can do the first frame and the tenth frame, and the computer kind of guesses what's in between, but now you can train AI with a data set and basically tell the computer if this is your person, okay, this is my outline on frame one, and this is my outline on frame 300, you figure it out. And 17 hours later, <laughs> the computer figures out how to rotoscope. And now it's looking at pixel differences instead of having 
have a human go through and tell it every single place. So that's one place where we're playing with it is just speeding up our rotoscoping and visual effects. And then another place is uh, there's some really cool new things that you can do with um, kind of like image transfer where you can train a computer to uh, like, we just worked on a documentary that's, I'm not sure when it's gonna come out, but uh, called The Long March and it's about World War II history. So we had to reenact some marches that were happening in the Philippines and we wanted to do it artfully. And so we hired an illustrator to hand draw these marchers. And then we made a 3D scene where the people were marching and we were able to use AI to basically put the textures of the illustration onto the characters. And then the AI figured out as the person moved how that would, how it would shade and how the outline would stay on the outside depending on where the camera was. And it's like a really very cool new type of 3D animation where we didn't have to go through and do it rotoscoping and drawing every single frame, but then we were also able to move the camera around things. We're in a courtroom and we did one front and one back illustration, and then the computer figured out how it was shaded if you move the camera. So a lot of that saves time and then it allows us like brand new techniques and like visuals that we can create. Buddy of mine was the guy that had to do all those in betweens before, and he worked on an adult swim program called Tree Corp LLC and stuff. And he's definitely seeing technology push him out of his job, but he's actually not totally against it because it was a very laborious process. Yes. Vince, I've been very impressed with Meow and their incorporation of technology into stuff. Where do you think uh, the future is going and stuff that excites you as you do more of these like monumental installations and things? Uh, it's hard for me not to just think about spatial computing and game engine type stuff in our community and real um you know what we're doing is we're using space to be able to like place imagination in space and very physically there's going to be like an incredible opportunity for imagination to be placed in space through spatial computing um and it's going to be the transition it's going to force the transition into into like a fully imagination realm like probably in our lifetime, lifetime i imagine um and so and that's that's kind of like the space that we're that we're interested in, I think, is like bringing people into the and into the world. So, you know, being able to combine the type of fictional worlds that we create in physical space and then be able to add spatial computing to that, um, and then allow for that spatial computing layer to then exist outside of the world of Meow Wolf, um, there's just a wonderful opportunity for creativity in that and combining with you know, the stuff that. And he's working on um, now you have like a whole economic system sitting within a spatial computing system that's able to empower value and trust artists like at any point in any in any city on any wall. And that's you know, that's probably the most exciting thing. It's crazy just to think about that. Man, what a world we're gonna be in here in a few years. So Annie, I think you've talked about a billion things that have all blown my mind in technology probably said some things that are already upsetting you, but besides yeah. the virtual worlds, like what do you think should be something that everyone in this room should keep an eye on? I'm really excited about tiered licensing and smart contracts. So um, I think royalties are mind blowing, but I think like once we can really start uh, tiering out different, like, you know, um, like I own the rights to the creative work, we have mutual rights, I'm selling you the rights and that being all automated and baked into the royalties. Um, I think interoperability is really important. Um, so there's some really incredible developers and teams of people working on uh, tying metaverses together by literally going in and um, trying to port files and um, scenes they've built from different VR worlds and trying to break them and ultimately documenting all of their research so that um, we can really build this like true giant like interoperable metaverse. Um, but I'm also excited for smart contracts to really um, be more user friendly so artists can literally create their own so no matter what platform they're using, they know that it'll carry through because um, we're starting to see some issues with that. Um, I'll just plug some tech that I just helped with, um, with uh, FIO protocol. Uh, we are about to announce, so not actually have announced it yet, but a new naming system for smart contracts. So you'll actually be able to search on either scan for your NFTs and it'll hopefully cut down on forgeries. So that's some of the stuff. 
Wow. All right. <laughs> so my apologies for not doing the question and answer session, but I believe all of our panelists will be happy to talk to you afterwards and stuff. But since we got five minutes left, I'd like to just uh, close with something. It's kind of simple and interesting, but you could go back and talk to your 22-year-old self right now and tell them something. What would you tell them? Nancy, you first. <laughs> Some of you know the yeah, Alps story, I said. Don't <laughs> <laughs> You're right. Love shots are forever. Well, I would say like, I would, I'd say like, uh, you know, my money's money is not the evil. Greed is the evil, but it's not money fault. You know, like for too long I was, for too long I I, I hated money. I didn't want to have anything to do with money. You know, because I, I associated greed with the, the dollar bill. But then I was able to like, like really understand, start to understand that like, no, it's the, it's the person, what they choose to value, that's the problem. Like, where do you put your value? Not what is the currency that you use to value? It's like, where do you put your value? So that was, that, I wish I would have learned that earlier. <laughs> what about you, Sean? I think maybe patience. I would tell myself to have patience with the process. Because I think um, I'm an impatient person. I, I want it right now. We're going to go do it. Like, I have an idea. We're going to go. And I think over, like, as I started my company, it was like, we're not big yet. We're not doing films yet. We don't, we're not on Netflix yet or whatever our next big thing might be. And I think uh, that patience as I'm, like, moving forward, uh, I, I felt like we were actually failing. It was like, you're three years in. Like, we're, we're only doing this five years in, we're only doing this. We've owned the company for eight years and we haven't even blanked whatever this thing I felt we should be doing. And I think that hedonic treadmill of trying to keep up with yourself, it's not actually failure, it's a process. Like it's a journey, I guess it's kind of lame to say, but I think I would have told myself to be patient of just like enjoy it and build and stay passionate and don't burn yourself out of trying to reach something that maybe it's not time to reach that yet. <laughs> what about you, Thomas? Buy Bitcoin. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's so ironic. I wish I had a bucket. But it's $60. I think I was the first time I bought it. Oh, yeah. Buy Bitcoin. Um, all the bread on Tom Brady. And skinny jeans is just a bad. It will run its course. That's what I do. But I would also tell myself to focus on impact. Um, when you're doing art, because regardless of what it looks like or, you know, the outcome, you know, it's all about the impact of the work that you're doing and making sure that, you know, you focus on that and everything, everything else will come into place. Because for me, when I make a work, I think it's good, it doesn't make an impact, it doesn't really move people, it didn't do its job. Um, but when I do something and I may think it's, you know, it's not the best work or something like that, but other people are moved by it and impacted by it. it that's what it's about. So for me, you know, when you're a young artist, you want everything to look good, um, which is what you know I was doing earlier. But over time, it's kind of like, as you get older, I learned like it's all about the impact and how it changes people uh, when they see the work and have them walk away, feeling something different, seeing the world a different way. Uh, moving differently, and sometimes you know you just don't know how that's going to come about. But really, it's like you just want to focus on being able to change someone in some form or fashion uh, with the work that you do, or else it's like you might as well just not you know do anything, uh, not even create because it's not going to really uh, have a uh, long lasting effect. So I mean, it's just focus on impact by the Great. Yeah. Any in the last minute? What do you got? It's so ironic because I was 22 when I first bought Bitcoin. <laughs> I'm 32 now, basically. Um, so I would tell my 22 years old self to keep that spirit of research and discipline alive from college. I was like a year out of college um, at 22. So just keeping that uh, research and like look at like some a goal you have and think of it as an assignment and carry it all the way through. And um, documentation is always important. So um, don't, you know, like think that what you're doing isn't important um, and just scrap it. So just, you know, try to keep good notes and um, look at it like an assignment and carry it through. Awesome. I want to thank you all for joining us and as well, those of you uh, tuning in online, I know we're at our time right now. 
you'd like to follow along on Instagram is the one I chose, but I am also not a big Zuckerberg fan. So uh, <laughs> if you choose to not use it, I'm sure there's plenty of other ways to connect with these wonderful panelists who'd be happy to potentially chat with you afterwards as well. Um, I just want to leave one last thought. It's my mom always used to say, I always thought was interesting is when I was growing up, she'd say, whatever job you will have one day does not exist right now. And I never fully realized what that meant until I run a projection art on the side <laughs> of the clock tower downtown and talk to people that are doing stuff that honestly 20 years ago I wouldn't ever thought of. So just remember that, that the job you may have in the future does not exist right now. And it is okay to go on that journey to figure it out. So again, a big thank you to everyone that came out. If you haven't seen the projection outside, hopefully it's still going. But uh, uh, thank you all for joining us. Thank you.